Good morning. Um, thank you for being here with us. But we're getting dangerously close to the noon briefing, so I'd better start. Um, uh, welcome to this press conference by Special Rapporteur on the situation of the human rights in Iran. He will make some opening remarks and then he'll take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I just... Yes. Sorry. Yes? Okay. Yes. Um, thank you. Good morning. Uh, dear journalist colleagues and friends, uh, it's good to see you here. Uh, I'm grateful to you all for your participation in today's press uh, conference and indeed for your continuing global uh, attention and interest uh, in the rapidly unfolding events in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, before addressing your questions, it has been customary for me to make a very brief a comment on, on my reports as well as my initial observations on the situation of the human rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran. So uh, colleagues, as we meet today, Iran is in turmoil, in part as a consequence of the killing of the 22-year-old uh, Gina Mahsa Amini, an Iranian woman from Kurdish minority. Uh, and I anticipate that, that you would have questions regarding um, her killing, uh, and I, I'd be happy to respond to these questions. But if I can just briefly say to you that, um, in my view, um, she is a victim of state brutality and state repression. Uh, there have been waves of protests calling for women, life, and freedom, both within Iran and outside. On the 22nd of September, together with seven special procedures mandate holders, I, denow, I denounced the crackdown on protesters, and I urged the Iranian authorities to immediately stop the use of lethal force in policing peaceful assemblies to avoid further violence, to hold an independent, impartial, and prompt investigation into, de into the death of Mahsa Amini, to make the findings of the investigation public, and to hold all perpetrators accountable. And there were similar calls from the United Nations and all around the world. These calls were not only ignored, but the highest state authorities clearly ordered security forces to repress uh, the protesters. Um, on, the, uh, on the issue of investigations um, into the death of uh, Gina Mas Amini, uh, there have been several state reports that have been issued by state officials and state forensic uh, officers asserting no misconduct or, or wrongdoing on the part of the state. These statements have been all rejected by Gina Masamini's family, whose request for the establishment of a committee of independent doctors to investigate her death has also been denied. Her family members have also uh, reportedly faced threats and pressure from the authorities. So therefore, it is clear that the so-called investigations into the death of Gina Masa Amini have failed the minimum requirements of impartiality and independence. Now, her death has given, or you know, the way it has happened, has given way to huge waves of protest spanning the geography of the country, its provinces, cities, and, and social strata. And these protests have called for change. And as I said, uh, the slogan, Women, life, and freedom uh, has become a slogan of that nation. And um, yesterday was 40 days since uh, she died. And we have a number of reports of protests that took place uh, all across Iran uh, in many provinces, including Tehran. And um, these protests are continuing. And protesters are seeking justice. They're seeking accountability. And if I can just add that um, unfortunate as, as it was that uh, Gina Masa Amini uh, was killed on 16th of September, she is not the first woman who has faced these brutal consequences, nor was she uh, the last one, because we, are, uh, we have received a, a number of reports about several other girls and women, and in fact, uh, children who have been killed by the state authorities, 
we have uh, a figure of at least 27 children who have been killed by the state authorities since these protests started. And the overall figure is a minimum of 250 people who have been killed by the state since the wave of these protests um, started on the 16th of September. Um, so uh, with that, I would, uh, I would invite colleagues to ask me questions. Uh, and then I'd try my best and would be happy to address those. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much on behalf of the, of the United Nations Correspondent Association for this press conference, uh, Valeria Robecco from ANSA Newswire. Uh, so the U.S. reiterated the call for an independent investigation to all the those responsible for the violence being carried out by the government of Iran accountable. And the same call uh, is made by several uh, human rights bodies and NGOs. Uh, what are the progress, what are the next steps you're planning to take? Okay, thank you. Should I uh, address? Yes. Um, thank you very much for this question. Uh, you're absolutely right that um, the international community um, uh, special procedures mandate holders, uh, myself, as I just mentioned, we have made very strong calls for investigations, independent investigations, impartial investigations into the death of Jena Masa Amini. Um, but this has not happened. We have consistently uh, asked for uh, accountability. Again, that has not happened. And therefore, um, I have, as you would have heard in my um, interactive dialogue yesterday, uh, I have said that in the current environment and in the absence of continuing, uh, uh, of, in the absence of any domestic channels of accountability, continuing absence of uh, domestic channels of accountability, I would say and I would stress once again that the international community has a responsibility uh, to, take, um, to, to take action uh, to address impunity for human rights violations in Iran, and I therefore have called for the prompt establishment of an independent investigative mechanism in all human rights violations leading up to and since the death of Gina Mahsa Amini. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Majid Gili, Rudaw Media Network. Thank you very much. I have three questions. The first one is, um, you said Gina Amini's uh, uh, killing is not the first one, and do you think it's a systematic issue in Iran? Do you think the Iranian government is targeting women? Um, and uh, the second question I have is about the Kurdistan of Iran. Uh, as you mentioned, the uh, events, especially in the past few days in Mahabad and other areas, there, there's a lot of protests, a lot of uh, even uh, killing of protesters there. Can you give us an update what's going on there? And do you think there is... Um, the Kurds in Iran are specifically being targeted by the Iranian authorities. And the third question is, uh, since these protests start after the killing of, of Amini uh, and all what's happening in Iran, there has been lots of death, uh, lots of carnage all across Iran. But the UN Secretary General and the Security Council, they've both been utterly silent about this. No condemnation, basically saying the, the bare minimum the, and shedding the, the, the least spotlight as they can on this issue. What do you think about all those as a special rapporteur? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Again, would, I, would you like no? Okay. So uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I would address um, each of these issues uh, one by one. Um, the, the subject and the issue of the enforced law on hijab, as I have said previously, it's a violation of women's rights. It's a violation of women's fundamental human dignity. And that is why the women and girls in Iran, they have, this, they have led this campaign and there's a very strong movement from within Iran. Now, if you see at the laws that they have, the, the penal code, for example, which enforces um, the, the law in hijab, you, you can see that there, is, uh, there are fines, but there are imprisonment up to two months. But not only that, there, is, um, there are morality charges and national security charges, which, which are much more draconian. And many women human rights defenders and many women who have defied this law have faced these 
very serious charges. So it's a very uh, um, problematic, very difficult issue. Uh, the role of the morality police is also very problematic. They have used violence in this case, but on many other cases. And if I can just take the opportunity of the of the of the case of Nika um, uh, Shakarimi, Shakarimi, who who also uh, was killed, and there is uh, evidence coming up, more and more evidence that she was brutally killed by state security. She was a 16-year-old girl. And therefore, uh, there are very serious systemic problems in the role of the morality police. And if I can say that this role and the way um, the authority, the uh, authorities led by President Ibrahim Raisi have, ha have dealt with this issue has been very uh, worrying because Ibrahim Raisi himself on a number of occasions has, has instigated has he also issued a decree a few months back saying that the law on, uh, on hijab must be enforced. So it has given a license to this morality police to enforce it more vigorously. And unfortunately, that is the problem. And, and this law needs to be abolished. You see, if we want integrity and uh, dignity of women to be restored, that law must be, uh, must be abolished. On the subject of Kurdistan and, uh, and uh, the issue uh, arising from Kurdistan, as you know that um, Kurdish people have historically and in, in contemporary terms uh, are being denied their fundamental human rights. And I will just give you one example that uh, Gina is a Kurdish name, you see, but she was not allowed to use that name to register on the national register because the state does not allow Kurdish identity or Kurdish expression in any shape or form. So this is just, uh, just a, a simple example of the repression which the Iranian state uses against the Kurdish people and, in fact, against other ethnic minorities. And uh, Kurd Kurdish people have been denied so many rights, starting from the right to identity, right to language, right to uh, represent themselves, right to uh, expression. And that, that, that is why Kurdish people and, and the Kurdish province, uh, you would see a lot of protests. Of course, um, the, what has ignited that is, the, is this killing of this young woman. But they have historic grievances which, which have come to the fore. And you, you asked me about um, you know, the, the deaths and you know, the figures. Um, these are very conservative figures. But um, the last uh, report that I did just a few weeks back, immediately after the death of uh, Gina Masamini, was that there were immediately at least 66 people who were killed in Kurdistan. And I have no doubt that there will be many more now. And if I can just add that ethnic minorities generally suffer extremely in, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, what I call uh, a black day in the history of Sistan and Balochistan was the 30th of September, when in one day, um, dozens of people, over 60 people, were slaughtered by the state authorities. And still, we've had no accountability for what happened. And finally, uh, you, meant, you asked for the UN bodies. I think there has been a lot of um, condemnation for what, what happened within the UN circles and in the international community. I am an independent expert, and I am speaking for myself. And therefore, I will say what I am doing. And I, I am hopeful, and I am very positive that the UN as an organization, and in fact, the international community, will take this matter very seriously. And we will have investigations and accountability. And therefore, uh, the demands of the people of Iran will be met. Thank you. James Bays from Al Jazeera is following up on that last question. Um, in response to the crackdown and repression, we're seeing um, certainly condemnation and we're seeing European and US sanctions. But from your vantage point, what else does the international community need to do to change things? Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Um, as, I, as I just uh, explained earlier, um, in the current environment and in the absence of any domestic channels of accountability, which I, I see that there are none, uh, I would ask the international community to set up an international mechanism, an investigative me mechanism, 
Uh, and the role of that mechanism would be accountability for what has happened since the death of Gina Masamini and the deaths of all these people that we're talking about, including uh, the, the case of Nika. Uh, Nika Shakar Army. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bahamak Alasi, BBC. Uh, if you did talk about the, the role of the hijab law and how this must be abolished, but is it time for, for your uh, self and the United Nations, perhaps, to acknowledge that the people of Iran are asking for, are far past this law and are asking for regime change? Uh, can you can you keep looking the other way? That almost all slogans are calling for the toppling of the supreme leader. There are almost no chants about hijab anymore. It's about change of this regime. Should that acknowledgement be part of your report or part of the conversation at least? Uh, secondly, on the number of deaths, uh, do you have a way of confirming how many there are? Because what we're seeing is what, well beyond 215. We know of multiple cases that people, families are being pressured not to talk about the fact that their loved ones was killed in on the streets. We have video evidence of people who weren't even protesting and got shot as they were simply driving through a protest. So the numbers are far higher than 215 or 250. Is there a way for you to come back with new numbers? Is there a mechanism? that you could do that. And lastly, you did talk about this international mechanism. How would that work? How would the regime, I don't know if you've had any meetings with them recently, if you could talk about any contacts that you've had with Iranian regime officials, but how could this, any of these mechanisms work with a regime that is not even responding to now your sixth, fifth report uh, on the situation of human rights in Iran? Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, uh, a set of great questions, so thank you. Um, well. On the first question, my focus is on the respect for human rights, you see. Uh, if you look at my report, uh, which I issued uh, to the Human Rights Council earlier this year, I, I recognized and I discussed the serious problems which exist within the constitutional and political system of the Islamic Republic of Iran, including the absence of separation of powers, the absence of democratic governance, uh, the absence of rule of law. And that is where I want change. See, if these mechanisms and if these changes are brought forward, I think a lot of the fundamental rights uh, can actually still be ensured. So my focus pretty much and the focus of my mandate is reform within the system, reform of human rights within the system. Uh, key changes have to be brought because if the system is not democratic, if there is no rule of law, if there's no separation of powers, you would not have accountability. You would not have fair trials. You would not have an independent head of judiciary. You would not have an independent president. Uh, and therefore, that is what uh, I'm focusing on. Um, on the subject of, uh, of new numbers, clearly uh, there has been a lot of brutality. There has been a lot of violence against people. And as you rightly, um, you know, as, as you rightly mentioned and explained, um, uh, there, there can be, and there, I have no doubt that there will be, uh, in reality, uh, there are far more, um, far greater number of casualties and deaths than, than what I have just said. Um, m this is a very conservative figure, and this is what I get from the most confirmed sources. And I, I try to be as accurate in my reporting as, as possible. Uh, but you would see civil society and other international uh, non-governmental organizations having different figures. But what I'm saying is that this is a, a minimum figure. But every death is too many. Every death, this, these deaths should not take place. That is the point. And that is where I think accountability is needed. And that is where I think that the international community must act now to set up an international investigative mechanism. And that leads on that leads me on to the next point that you, you also raised, is uh, whether I've had meetings with the Iranians and what, you know, what can actually happen in terms of having an investigative mechanism. Well, there are precedents where investigative mechanisms have been set up. There are a number of precedents. And the consent of the relevant state is not necessarily a prerequisite to set up these investigative mechanisms. Uh, it, is the, it, it is the commitment of the international community to set up these investigative mechanisms. And therefore, I'm, I'm looking towards 
support from member states here uh, so that they realize the, the gravity of the situation and, and true accountability is conducted through an investigative mechanism. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Good to see you, sir. Yeah. Um, just a quick follow-up. Uh, you haven't mentioned if you uh, have contacts actually with Iranian officials, and I wanted to ask you, I'm assuming your visit was not allowed into the country. Um, did they see, did the regime see your report before you published it? This is just the first technical question. Then I have another one. Okay, so <laughs> you want me to answer this first? Okay, right. Okay, yeah, you're right. The, the Iranian authorities uh, have not allowed me to visit the country. They have, in fact, not allowed me to visit the country ever since I, uh, I took the mandate in 2018. Uh, but they have not allowed any of my predecessors either. Th this mandate, as you know, was renewed and uh, restarted in 2011. So none of my predecessors, nor myself, we have not been allowed into the country. I, I repeat it so many times, and I repeat it today as well, if, if, uh, if the authorities are listening. I, I should be allowed, I want to be there, I should be there now to report to you, to address all of these questions. Uh, but unfortunately, that's not happened. Uh, I have some engagement with the Iranian authorities. I uh, always, and this is our protocol that we, whenever we prepare a, uh, a report, we send it to, to the state, uh, to the Iranian authorities for their comments. Um, sometimes they do comment uh, on substantive matters, but a, a number of times, in fact, most of the times, uh, it is just that this report is too political, I'm too biased, I'm, 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 as you heard yesterday, that I'm, uh, my information is from anti-state uh, terrorist groups. So they, they don't engage on the substance, and that is where I think there is, uh, there's a need for them to reform. Uh, we need to talk about substance, we need to, to deliver and we need to, to have uh, human rights uh, laws respected and promoted within Iran. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the uh, second question is, this is not the first time that we see Iranians take to the streets. In fact, since the beginning of your mandate, perhaps we have seen many, many, and we hear from you a lot, actually. And it's always encountered by a brutal crackdown from the regime. Is there anything, though, about this particular protest any signs that make you feel that this is probably, we're reaching uh, the point of no return? Is this really, do you expect anything um, decisive to happen based on these protests? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Right, uh, a great question. My simple answer is that how many times can you brutalize people? How many times can you violate uh, their fundamental human rights, their fundamental dignity? And um, in this uh, series of protests, in these wave, this wave of protests, there is, there, is a, there is a real issue. What about women and girls of Iran? They have stood up. These are young people who are out on the streets. Women do not want to be oppressed and subjugated. They are young, bright, intelligent women. They see the world. I mean, the world is changing. The, the social media, we are, we, are, we are seeing all of this happening. Iranian authorities, brutal as they are, uh, repressive as they are, they cannot stop young people. They will not be able to stop, uh, stop this movement. And the point about uh, previous occasions is that absolutely correct, that we saw that in 2019 as well. Hundreds of people were killed, and yet there was no ac accountability, there was no investigation, and that is why I think now is the time. If we do not do anything now, if we just uh, kept silent, then what would happen to all of these millions of people in Iran? They will be subjugated, brutalized, and, and, and they, will, they will lose, the, there is a risk that they will lose hope. And, uh, and uh, you know, there could be very serious consequences for these people. Thank you. Hi, this is Mehdi Aghazamani from Voice of America Persian Service. You suggested international community can take some responsibilities uh, to address immunity of the human rights violator in Iran. And would you please uh, elaborate on it and let us know about the world community, what can do, what can action right now immediately to stop the violence against the people and stop it right now? Thank you. Important question. Uh, well. Uh, 
the starting point has been uh, a global condemnation, which I see that all states, uh, at least a majority of the states, uh, have condemned and they continue to condemn uh, what the, the brutality which we are witnessing in the Islamic Republic of Iran. But that is not enough. That's what I'm saying, that there needs to be further, more important steps to be taken. So what I'm campaigning for, what I'm asking is that because there is absence of any domestic channels of accountability, the international community should set up uh, an international investigative mechanism of what is happening in Iran to see and to investigate uh, these very serious uh, criminal offenses, hold perpetrators to account. There, there must be a thorough investigation. There must be accountability. And the international community must act. Otherwise, these millions of people would be subjugated and they would have no hope. Thank you. We have time for one last question. I have a question in the chat. Marian? Please. Can you? Do, you? do you still have your question? Marian? Yes, hi. Uh, so you uh, the first place. Thank you so much for this briefing today. I joined um, a little bit um, late since I'm traveling right now. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, this is Maryam Ramadi uh, with Iran International. Um, I'm not sure if this question was asked already or not, but um, since I'm working with people and I'm in touch with people in Iran specifically, um, they're asking uh, from the UN specifically to do more um, about the situation in Iran, it's, uh, especially about suppressing the um, uh, protests in Iran. What do you think that United Nations can do um, and what is in plan already to help with people, um, th with the people of Iran? And also, um, what do you know about the situation of journalists in Iran and also um, the um, internet access uh, to people of Iran? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Right. Um, yes, uh, there's two, two questions. Uh, Mariam, thank you very much. Uh, I, have, um, I have in part addressed your first question. Uh, as I say that uh, it's now incumbent, it's really important that the, that the United Nations and the international community takes concrete actions. Um, in the absence of domestic channels of accountability, I would once again stress that it's important that an international investigative mechanism is established, which can hold um, individuals who have committed these gross violations of human rights accountable. So that's the first point. On the subject of journalists and uh, internet uh, issues, um, again, it's a very unfortunate uh, situation. I have, um, I have mentioned that in my presentation yesterday, uh, the figures. Uh, Iranian authorities um, unfortunately uh, abuse uh, the power that they have. Uh, there has been a complete shutdown um, of internet uh, and, uh, and media since this uh, protest started. In fact, this is their historic um, uh, approach towards uh, shutting down uh, freedom of expression. So every time we have protests, we, we had protests in Khuzestan, we had protests uh, in 2019, the internet was completely shut down, it was blocked, and therefore uh, they, 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 they try to restrict access to, the, to, to information. But they also target journalists. So uh, they, have, uh, they have arrested dozens of journalists in this, uh, during this wave of protests, including uh, the, the journalist um, who first uh, spread or informed us about the death of Gina Masani Amini has also been arrested. And therefore, journalists are a target um, for this uh, brutalization and this repression by the Iranian authorities. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.